Good morning. Uh, I am Pastor Zach. I'm the student ministry pastor here at Wisconsin Christian Church, and today is my birthday. Uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm 29 years old today, and uh, over the last 29 years, I've experienced a lot of growth. Uh, physically, I've grown a lot. I've grown a lot this way. Over the next 29 years, I'll probably grow a lot this way. Uh, if you've ever had a meal cooked by my wife, you know that that's probably true. I've grown a lot personally. I've had a lot of experiences being in ministry, uh, being a husband, being a father, that have caused me to become more mature and more responsible as a person. I've also grown a lot spiritually. Uh, I am much closer to God now and much more like Jesus now than I was when I started walking with the Spirit about 12 years ago. There is one thing I haven't outgrown, and I'm going to see if you can figure it out. Um, this is a picture of me on my third birthday at my Batman birthday party. This next is a picture of me on my 28th birthday at my Batman birthday party. Um, so I haven't outgrown my love for Batman, but I've grown up in a lot of other ways. And actually, that's what we're talking about this morning is this idea of growth. Um, you see, we've been in, we're in the middle of this series called Life on Mission. And we're discovering how to be Christians and how to be a church that is on mission with the gospel. And actually, our senior minister, Mike, is leading a missions team in India right now. So they're doing ministry in India as we speak. But you don't have to go to India to be on mission. And you don't have to go across the world with the gospel. Sometimes all you have to do is go across the street or go across the hallway or go across the room. And in order to accomplish our mission, we've been looking at five specific action steps that we can take. And the fourth one is what we're looking at this morning, and that is grow. So this morning is all about growth. It's all about maturity. And there's a few thoughts I'd like to share with you today. And the first one is this. Our goal is to become mature. Our goal as Christians and as a congregation is to become mature. And I feel like when we start talking about spiritual growth or spiritual maturity, uh, it can get a little hazy. It can get a little unclear what we're talking about. So right up front, I'm just going to define it for us. I'm going to give you a definition. Um, spiritual maturity means we grow closer to God as the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. I'm going to say that again because I think you should write it down. Spiritual maturity means we grow closer to God as the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. Does that make sense? Is that simple? Is that clear? It's really not that hard to understand. The more like Jesus you are, the closer to God you'll be, and the more mature you'll be. But the opposite's also true. The less like Jesus you are, the further away from God you'll be, and the less spiritually mature you'll be. So it's really not that hard to understand. And this is our goal as Christians. We don't tend to think in these terms, though, right? We either think that we're a Christian or not a Christian. We either think we're saved or we're not saved. Either we're in or we're out. But our goal isn't just to be in Christ. Our goal is to be mature in Christ. And we get this goal actually from the Apostle Paul. So if you have your Bible, open up to the book of Colossians. And Colossians is a short letter in the middle of the New Testament. You have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians. And this is our goal, to be mature. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul says, We proclaim Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. And that word perfect can be translated as complete or also mature. Paul's goal as a preacher, as a pastor, was to present everyone mature in Christ. And that is our goal as well, to be mature in Christ. But maturity doesn't just happen. Maturity isn't the result of just being saved or of just being born again. Maturity is the result of training. If you're going to be mature in Christ, you have to train yourself to be mature in Christ. And we also learn this from the Apostle Paul. If you go ahead a few books to 1 Timothy uh, you're in Colossians, then you have First and Second Thessalonians, then First Timothy. In chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, he tells Timothy this, Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life 
and the life to come. So he says, train yourself to be godly. But I feel like I should tell you up front, there is a little bit of mystery in this process. There is a little bit of mystery to spiritual training because we don't make ourselves more mature. Uh, we can't. But So what happens is, as we spend time with God, and you know how to do that, as we study the Bible, as we pray, spend time in worship and fellowship, as we spend time with God in these ways, we become more like Jesus. And this expresses itself in our character and in our conduct. In other words, as you're becoming more like Jesus, that will show itself in who you are and how you treat others. But when exactly does the growth occur? At one point exactly in this process, does the Holy Spirit change us? I don't know. Is it when we're reading the Bible or when we're worshiping? Is it when we're obeying in our daily life? Is it both? Is it neither? Is it sometime in between there? I don't know. I can't tell you exactly when it happens. There's a little bit of mystery there, but what's not mysterious is that our goal is to be mature, and maturity takes training. Um, I want to read to you from one of my favorite books. It's called The Pursuit of Holiness by author Jerry Bridges, The Pursuit of Holiness. If you don't have it, you should get it. It's short, so it won't cost that much, and it won't take you too long to read. And this book could easily be called The Pursuit of Maturity. And he describes this process of spiritual maturity like farming. And I want to read to you from uh, a portion of this book. He says, A farmer plows his field, sows the seed, and fertilizes and cultivates, all the while knowing that in the final analysis, he's utterly dependent on forces outside of himself. He knows he cannot cause the seed to germinate, nor can he produce the rain and sunshine for growing and harvesting the crop. For a successful harvest, he's dependent on these things from God. Yet the farmer knows that unless he diligently pursues his responsibilities to plow, plant, fertilize, and cultivate, he cannot expect a harvest at the end of the season. In a sense, he's in a partnership with God, and he will reap its benefits only when he's fulfilled his own responsibilities. Farming is a joint venture between God and the farmer. The farmer cannot do what God must do, and God will not do what the farmer should do. We can say just as accurately that the pursuit of holiness is a joint venture between God and the Christian. No one can attain any degree of holiness without God working in his life, but just as surely no one will attain it without effort on his own part. So the Holy Spirit is the one who produces the maturity in us, but we have to train ourselves to become mature in Christ. And although this is our goal, our goal is to become mature, we know that the problem as many of us are immature. I think most of the Christians in this country are very immature in Christ. And I think the reason for that is because we live such undisciplined lives. I mean, if, mature, if um, maturity takes training, training takes discipline. And because most of us are spiritually undisciplined, most of us are spiritually immature. I mean, think about the basic disciplines. Think about church attendance. I mean, nowadays, it seems like most people, even some of you, We'll skip church for any and every reason. If anything else comes up on a Sunday morning, we're there. It's like church is just something we go to if something better doesn't come up. Uh, think about prayer. How many of us are actually spending time with the Lord in prayer every day? We wake up. We get uh, so distracted by everything that's going on. We get so caught up in the crap that the world says is important. But how many of us are actually spending time alone with the Lord to get our peace and our priorities and our perspective from him. Uh, you want to talk about Bible reading? Forget it. Most Christians in this country spend more time watching TV in one evening than they do reading the Bible the entire week. Maybe even the entire month. It's so pathetic, and I could yell at you so much for this, um, but I won't. I'm going to play a clip instead. Um, I'm going to play a clip from a Voice of the Martyrs podcast, and in this clip, the host is interviewing a Voice of the Martyrs worker in North Korea. And I want you to hear what this worker says. So go ahead with that, Rob. Uh, I think the early North Korean Christian believers in the late 1940s chose well, and they chose these pillars. They said, what, what absolutely must one know in order to be a Christian? And so I find today that even though here in the U.S. the average Christian owns nine Bibles and is actively trying to buy one more, whereas biblical literacy continues to decline, the folks that we're working in, in North Korea, they only know the Ten Commandments, they only know the Lord's Prayer, they only know the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Supper, and yet they know more about the Christian faith than the ordinary average American Christian. Okay, in case you didn't catch that, let me sum it up for you. 
The Christians in North Korea who don't have Bibles know more about the Bible than the Christians in America who do have Bibles. And I think that says it all. Uh, and the New Testament gives us no grace on this. There is absolutely no excuse to not mature spiritually. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. You're in 1 Timothy, so from there you'll go to 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, then Hebrews. And we're in Hebrews chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. And the author says, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. And this passage is really a call to maturity. It's a call to grow up. And, and look at how he talks about his readers here. He says, you're slow to learn. You're so dumb. Um, he says, you should be teaching other people, but you're still students. You still need to be taught the basics all over again. And he says, you, you should be eating solid food by now, but you're still drinking milk. And although you should be mature, grown adults, you're still babies. Um, and he uses the imagery of nursing in this passage. Now, I know we have a few nursing moms in our congregation right now. I'm sure many of you nursed your own kids in the past. And uh, nursing's a good thing, okay, right? Like, if you can do it, nursing is the best thing for your baby. But even though it's good, eventually, that kid has to be weaned, right? After about a year, you want to pop the kid off, <laughs> start giving him a bottle, start making him eat from the table. I mean, can you imagine if there was a mom in our church who took your five-year-old into the nursery between services for a snack? Like, that's a problem. Um, I actually have a clip of what this would be like, so go ahead. That's awkward, right? <laughs> like if your kid can run up to you, say he needs milk, and then stand there while drinking it, that's a problem. Um, and Kevin James plays the kid's dad in this movie, and he's so embarrassed. He doesn't even want to say how old the kid is because he knows his kid is way too old for that. I wonder if Jesus gets embarrassed by us. When Jesus looks at the church, and he sees so many Christians who should be mature by now, still suckling at the church's breast. I wonder if Jesus just shakes his head and says, man, you guys are way too old for this. Here's the thing. If we're going to be a church that's on mission, and if we're going to be a church that accomplishes its mission, we don't have time to nurse you. We don't have time to hold your hand and change your diapers and wipe your nose. So pop yourself off our breast and start nourishing yourself. Let's look at another scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1. You're in Hebrews, so we've got Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, then 2 Peter. We're going to read from 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. And this is another call to maturity, another call to grow up. Peter says in verse 3, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Basically, that's a big, long way of saying you have everything you need to become mature. He goes on to say, for this very reason... Because you have everything you need to be mature, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, 
and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, love. So Peter goes on and he says, since you have everything you need to become mature, become mature, right? And he says, add to your faith. And we would stop Peter right there. We would say, whoa, whoa, Peter, add to your faith. Uh Uh-uh, I'm saved by grace through faith alone. You can't add anything to faith. And he would say, yeah, you're right. But a saving faith is a faith that grows and develops and matures. So he says, add to your faith. Add to your faith all these qualities. And I like this list because this is like Peter's fruits of the Spirit. You guys have read Paul's fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5, right? Well, right here, this is Peter's fruits of the Spirit. And he says, these are the qualities you will have if your faith is growing. So he tells us to grow up. And then in verse 8, he tells us why. For if you possess these qualities in increasing, in increasing measure, in other words, if you are growing and maturing, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see that our level of growth really determines our level of effectiveness in our mission. He says, if you're growing, you'll be productive. You'll be effective. But the implication is, if you're not growing, you won't be productive. And you won't be effective. And that leads me to my last thought for today. We must be mature to accomplish our mission. We must be mature to accomplish our mission. And this is for a couple reasons. First of all, our maturity validates our message. So, um, you guys remember show and tell when you were a kid? You remember when your kids had show and tell at least? (laughs) Okay. Um, Show and tell, it's fun, right? This is when all the kids bring in something from home and they show it to the class and they tell the class about it. Now, if show and tell was just tell, it really wouldn't be that exciting. I mean, if some kid got up there and just started talking about something they loved, the rest of the kids really aren't going to care. But when the kid brings it in and he shows it to them, then the kids are interested in it. They want to hear about it. They want to play with it. They want to figure it out. A lot of times we think evangelism is tell. We think evangelism is just you tell somebody about Jesus. When really evangelism is show and tell. If you're going to tell someone that Jesus can change their life, you better be able to show how he's changed yours. And if you can't show how he's changed yours, why would anybody believe you when you say he can change theirs? So our maturity validates our message. And also our maturity makes us useful. It makes us useful to the Lord. Um, Go back to 2 Timothy. And we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And in verses 20 and 21, Paul says this, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some are for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be made an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Doesn't that sound good? Wouldn't you like to be useful to Jesus? prepared to do anything he asks you to? Well, Paul tells us how. We have to grow. Again, our growth determines our effectiveness. That's what he's talking about here when he says he compares us to a house. And he says, cleanse yourself of anything that isn't useful. It's like you guys have had a garage sale, right? Cleanse yourself of anything that isn't useful so that you can be totally useful to the Lord. And again, we don't think in these terms. We think either I'm a Christian or I'm not a Christian. But what Paul's saying is, there is such a thing as a useful Christian and a useless Christian. And he tells us to make ourselves useful to the Lord. You guys know who Thomas the Tank Engine is? You ever seen the show or read the stories? Sir Topham Matt, hey, is he up? There he is. Yeah, Thomas the Tank Engine. Uh, Thomas and his friends, they're train engines. They live on the island of Sodor. And this is Sir Topham Matt. He's the director of the railway. Sometimes he's just called the fat director. And uh, he's just, just this funny little guy. He's the director, so he always gives the trains their assignments. And, uh, you know, God bless him. Thomas and his friends, they always start off by screwing it up. So I think there's one line in every episode that says, Sir Topham Hat was very cross. And it's a British show, so he's not cranky. He's very cross. Um, but it ends well. You know, Thomas and his friends get their act together. 
they figure out what they're doing, and they do it. And then at the end of every episode, Thomas and his friends are pulling back into the station to sleep for the night, and Sir Topham Hatt is there kind of debriefing them on the day, and he always says this, good job, Thomas, you were a really useful engine. And that's how it always ends, a really useful engine. And that is like, if you're an engine on Sodor, that is what you want, like that is your purpose, to be a really useful engine. And I thought it was funny at first, but after I saw a few episodes, it started reminding me of this scripture uh, and the other scriptures in the New Testament that say we're supposed to be useful to the Lord. So let me ask you, which Christians do you think are useful? The mature or the immature? Which churches do you think are useful? The mature or the immature? See, we have to be mature to accomplish our mission because it makes us useful to the Lord. So in conclusion, I just want to tell you, uh, start training. Start training yourself for spiritual maturity. You know what to do, just start doing it. It's kind of like physical training. We all know what we need to do to get into better shape. It's actually pretty simple. You got to hit the gym more. You got to watch what you eat. You got to get enough sleep. Exercise, diet, and rest. That's it. It's not rocket science. We know what to do. We just don't do it. Right? There's this thing called letting yourself go. Have you guys heard of that? After you've been married and you've had a few kids and you get more responsibilities at work, you just kind of accept your body and your health for what they are. You know, you wake up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror, and you just say, yep, and you move on, right? And, and you can justify that a little bit because Paul said physical training is of some value, but no matter how fit you are, no matter how in shape you are, you're still going to die someday. So you really shouldn't let yourself go, but at least you can justify it. There is no justification for letting yourself go spiritually. There is no way to justify just accepting your spiritual maturity for what it is and not training yourself uh, to be more mature. It's only when we're maturing as believers that we'll mature as a body. And it's only when we're maturing as a body that we'll accomplish our mission.